because of holidays, it's rather difficult to get some uh, English English guests. I know. So we have uh, Mr. 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 Jariullah Akinbola Babola of uh, Birmingham, Mr. Funky Bayo Parasetio, who is from uh, Northampton, who accepted Ramdiyat two weeks ago. Uh, yes. yes. Just two weeks ago? Yes. I thought you were born Ramdiyat. No. From Indonesia. Yes. Okay. Uh, Mr. Fareed Ahmad, uh, who is um, uh, from uh, visiting from America. Yes. Uh -huh. And Dr. Atal Rahman. Of course. Uh, is an MRCB student. Have you decided to return home after? Or you have got a job, some, some job somewhere here? No, sir. No, sir. I don't have find a job there. Mm -hmm. uh, I have filed for registration in Ireland. Mm -hmm. But uh, there is, I can serve with Iqbal Sab, Amuriam. And uh, it also said there is a problem of the visa. I should, should go back to Pakistan and get visa from there. I know, but I didn't want to find out all the details of all the details, but just the final decision. What have you decided? Uh, so my final decision, I I apply for registration here, uh, and I go back to Pakistan and uh, yes, get visa from there. So the first question is a written question from Mrs. Uh, Gunilla Fazal of Gothenburg, who has asked several other questions, but uh, this is a question she wants to Gothenburg. She says, what do you think about other life forms like UFOs having contact with us? Uh, she says that she believes that the governments in the largest countries have contacts with other life forms, but they refuse to go public because there will be chaos in the world. This is wrong. <coughs> Absolutely wrong. No government has any life, life contact with any extraterrestrial form of life. Only in such literature, you know, as they particularly create to excite people and to sell such literature because of that excitement, they go on writing this fib and fiction. This is no reality whatsoever. Please. So my question is um, um, based around the status of women. Um, in the East, a lot of women in Africa or in India, Pakistan, so on, tend to um, understand that there's a lot of responsibility for them within the home and within around the children. But in the West, it's a new concept, or maybe it's a concept that seems to have passed. So they believe that it's pushing back women's status. So how would you explain for me, um, for me to explain to other women in the West that um, the it's a valid The women status. in the West is not that rosy as it is uh, portrayed, particularly by the church, whenever they want to criticize Islam. First of all, whatever status the women in the West enjoy is not a Christian status. Okay. It's absolutely wrong. It has nothing to do with the Christianity. But Christianity provides women by way of their rights and responsibilities is much worse than what Islam does. So if a comparison has to be made between religion and religion, it should be done properly with references. As far as the West goes, the toy claims are absolutely falsified by their own published reports about the status of women actually in these countries. Go to the uh, lower class, as they call it, in my opinion, every class is just one class of humans, but according to their terminology, you go to the lower labor class and find out what's happening to the women here in England now, today. Mm -hmm. Everywhere, the reports are so horrifying that the women are put practically to slavery, hard labor by their rugged husbands who have no purpose in life but to go where to work and earn and spend as much on their own as they possibly can and uh, bear the minimal responsibility at home. And then after drinking, they return home and then sometimes, and very often, not sometimes, they are very harsh to the women waiting for their husband's returns. And uh, the children are left to shift for themselves in the streets, become criminal, 
and uh, try to find some ways of happiness on their own, become rare verdicts and this and that. This is the real life. What about the rosy picture you see on the television, etc.? It's sheer nonsense. It has no reality whatsoever. The type of life they portray, and in the name of that life, they criticize Islam as if in Islam is an orthodox, a, a, a religion of the past and without any pleasure, without any human freedom. All that is absolutely false. What you see on television is a very small minority of the total population of America and, and England which can even dream of enjoying that thing. What they portray in their films, etc., as an excellent life, freedom of, of uh, freedom to do whatever you like and freedom to have access to every sort of pleasure you dream of. Where is that freedom? It cannot be supported by an economic means. Their economy is divided, of course, in many tiers, like every other economy is, but the majority of your people belong to such lower order of economy where to dream of such luxuries is, is a crime. Your hand to mouth living and going to pub is the maximum you can enjoy. So you release passions for things, you release desires, create desires, in fact, in the name of freedom of, of whatever you like, eh? and no religious taboos. But when you release these desires, they become like the genie of the bottle. Once they release, they begin to rule you. <laughs> and the life is made miserable under that genie. This is exactly what you have, you have here. Yeah. Islamic system, treatment of women is, is a fantastic system of, not fantastic in that sense, but fantastic in the sense of its beauty. It give, restores rights for women, it uh, restore, rehabilitates their lost honor and makes them equal partner and uh, provides them the right of inheritance. In which other society the right of inheritance of women has been so strongly and positively established as in Islam? So there are just brief comments on this subject. In fact, on all the heads which I have just mentioned in passing, I have spoken in depth and in detail. And uh, I don't want to repeat that all, That's even if it will become boring for the listeners and viewers, right? That's fine. Thank you. Mm -hmm. My question is, uh, how, how to keep my soul and my heart head, uh, together and just consider to Allah in every prayer because uh, I feel hard to do this. It is very hard. Yes. Have you ever tried to climb a mountain? Mm, yes. Is it easy? No. So, if you are climbing, it is hard. It has to be hard. If climbing a mountain is hard to reach the seventh heaven. Mm. In uh, spiritual ascendance, uh, spiritual ascent, must be a very uh, difficult task indeed. But as you begin to move, it becomes easier, and as you compare your previous position in relation to the new heights gained, you always feel happier and happier mm. and become more confident. So don't think it is a matter of duty that you suddenly become a Muslim or true believer in God and suddenly there you are with Him. The Prophet's journey for the first forty years towards God was a very difficult journey of denial of pleasures and this and that and so on and so forth and polishing your own character and conduct in relation to mankind. Then God uh, considered them worthy of being appointed as his representative. And from then a new journey begins. So we have to cover all those uh, paths which begin with the beginning of Prophet's life and end up in those celestial heights which we cannot even look at because it's too big, too, too, too 
far removed from us, you know. Yeah. Such prophets, as we know from the Quran and particularly has Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they all seem to disappear in, in some celestial heights where you can't see them anymore. Like the heavens, most of them are invisible and uh, the stars you see which fill the entire sky are just a small proportion of what is filled with, uh, in heaven. The luminous bodies, first of all, are very small, but as they go farther away, it becomes impossible to see what's happening there. The light which has started, which started this journey around uh, say 18 billion or 15 billion years ago from the boundaries of the universe has just started reaching here. And now they know, they think they know that uh, what's ha it's, it's something is happening there but it is wrong to say something is happening there. The information they have received is 15 billion years old. <laughs> what has happened now, nobody knows. What is happening now, nobody knows. What happened in between. So these are material heights. But spiritual heights are similar in nature. And uh, the vastness is really is huge. To travel in the direction of God is not a matter of a day or two. It's a whole lifetime occupation. And then you gain the heights after laboring. But according to Hazrat Muhammad Rasulullah you should not labor too hard. Take it easy and simple. Like the like a person who is not an expert mountaineer, if he starts trying to imitate those whom he sees on television, you know, rising, <laughs> climbing with the ropes and doing this and that, it's, it will be very unlikely that he will survive. So, in spiritual efforts, Hazrat Muslim al-Islam also has very clearly warned that if you do too much or try to gain heights which you cannot physically in that space of time in which you want to do it, then you are in for destruction. So the best advice is that of Hazrat Muhammad Sallallahu He says, faith is made easy for you, don't make it hard. If you want to force God to be pleased with you, you will always be defeated and broken down. You can't force God to be pleased with you. So whatever potentials He has offered you, whatever capacity you have, do it within that and bit by bit until you feel familiar with that way of life and it becomes easy and becomes a daily habit, then proceed a few, a few steps further and so on and so forth. So you have taken it far too seriously and uh, you know, you want to perform things within a matter of days, it will not happen. But to move in a certain direction is a must. And every step you take, however small it may be, it will still be an assurance that you are gaining something. Right? Yes. Got it? Thank you, sir. Yes. Now, what is the news from the United States of America and New York and uh, uh, what's that? Uh, which island? State of Ireland. Staten Island. Right. Yes. Everybody is doing fine, thank you. Fine. Very, very Everybody is fine. Yes, they're sending all the slides. And to how's the Zamaat? The Jamaat is progressing very well. Yes. Um, Hazur, my question is that I was reading in the British Medical Journal that one to six or one to eight couples are uh, are infertile. What? Infertile. infertile. Right. My question had to do with test tube babies. Suppose a, a Muslim couple um, had problems conceiving and they didn't want to adopt. Is is it permissible in Islam? to go ahead and, and have a procedure of course it is permissible. There is no point in even arguing that. I have spoken many times before. It is permissible to help a legal marriage get consummated. So the consummation of marriage right. 
in fact is done when you begin to reproduce. To help achieve the purpose of marriage is not at all forbidden. But to have uh, surrogate mothers, etc., that is not permissible, of course. It's a different story, right? right. right. And uh, what else did you say in the beginning? It was the, the, the one to six or one to eight couples are in I, I think this may be applicable to America or some other European countries, right? But it is not applicable to the world at large. In Ga in, in Africa. The story is so different, isn't it? Mm. Very few couples remain um, sterile. Right. Otherwise, most of the marriages are very productive, sometimes overproductive. Mm -hmm. The same is the case in of Pakistan and India, etc. So, infertility or sterility they go with hand in hand with the modern ways of life. Over much luxury, using your potentials only for gaining pleasure, not for uh, the purpose for which they are created. Because the purpose is requires your responsibility to discharge towards your family, etc., etc. So most of the young people, men, girls and boys inclusive, begin their journey into pursuit of pleasure with a definite, definite uh, decision that they will delay, delay their marriages as much as possibly they can and enjoy the fruits of marriage without paying for them. So this creates infertility and in many cases in Europe I found it myself because I am a homeopath not by profession but, but as a hobby I do it and many uh, German and other couples I have in mind, European couples I mean, yes. whenever they meet me because they hear of my, uh, you know, well, I shouldn't do not use the fame, but they hear about me that I am gaining some, uh, I have gained some knowledge of homeopathy. So because of that they come to me and uh, whenever I inquire of the background, invariably they tell me that for the first three years or four years or even five years, they practiced uh, family planning consciously and intentionally. And irregularities in the menstrual cycle began later on. And when they finally decided, somehow, the, without any visible, detectable reason, they could not produce children. Now I have read some more about it, and I can say that this uh, uh, behavior of taking a meaningful system lightly does not go unpunished. The system itself realizes that they are playing with me. They have made a joke out of it. And some allergies developed to the conception. Some defensive system around the uterus goes limp because it is repeatedly aroused and yet nothing happens. So the result is that even if the lady is not suffering from any tumors or uh, endometritis, things like that, she cannot bear because the uterus is not capable of defending against its own internal defense system, body's defense system. Every time a lady conceives, the bombardment of antibodies surrounds the uterus from all sides and wants to penetrate and destroy the intruder. 
because the human system of self defense which is called immune system this is attuned to every foreigner's uh, entry into the system to attune in the sense that it is attuned to immediately know and recognize that some foreign thing has happened has entered the system and is attuned to react immediately against it pregnancy is no exception the moment a child is conceived the human immunological system immediately becomes aware that an intruder has come it's on child you know <laughs> because there is not just the mother's participation it is there is the participation of a man which is a foreigner alien i mean eh? and as such the body reacts in every case it does but god has provided for this and the uterus linings are provided with a counter defense system against the immunological reaction of the own of, of that same, same body bombardment versus counter bombardment <laughs> defend all the defensive armors are provided right. this is what i'm talking about right. whenever things happen and uh, the whole system of the reproductive whole reproductive system is aroused to a sort of hope that a child is to be conceived right. if it happens once and uh, then it doesn't it does not damage do da- any damage to the uterus to my knowledge but if it does not happen in the first few years of marriage or first few years of relationship between woman and boy ma- a girl and a boy or woman and man then this system is definitely adversely affected and the rising incidence of uh, infertility or sterility is also related to this why i say this is not just my layman's experience leading me to this conclusion i have read latest researches published in the important scientific magazines which say that of all the ladies who cannot bear 40% of them are those who have just an allergy see <laughs> allergy against this foreign intruder right. this is exactly what i'm telling you about and this they realize they recognize they have published these facts that this allergy is common to all humans but somehow the counter allergic system in their uterus etc is not sufficient sufficient enough to defend the baby the, the the embryo so what i found from my own um, occasional practice of homeopathy has been now proved as a scientific fact so it is wrong to say that 8% or so of the world population <coughs> is infertile just because of some uh, natural phenomenon it is not so the natural phenomenon of sex is is perfect the flaws appear when we misuse it and in such countries where it is more misused the incidence of flaws will rise see now a new science has developed in america of creating resistance against the antibodies and raising the level of defense and they have this very expensive system of law but still some women have benefited from from this so i'm telling you don't play with the, with nature don't take the natural uh, laws and phenomena working in phenomena working in our system over lightly you can't 
permanently separate the purpose with the organ for which it is created. If you remove the purpose and misuse it for other incidental things, then it will not go entirely unpunished. You are likely to be punished. Thank you. Can you see the whole thing or no? Yeah, um, the other part I wanted to ask you was, what about um, artificial insemination by donor, where the donor remains anonymous to the couple? So that's what I have told you, it's out of question. Out of question, yes. Because donor is not married to the wife. That's right. That's right. Or surrogate mother is not married to the, to the husband of another woman. Right. So why not permit uh, polygamy and uh, polyandry and, you know, freedom to have anything? Right. Why go to the doctor and pay so much? Why do not go to a man and get a baby? <laughs> it's as simple as that. Practically, this is what happens. Thank you. Thank you. My question is regarding homeopathic medicine. Uh, as we see that Has it just developed after my talk on homeopathy? <laughs> no. Or did you come with this purpose? I come with okay. this. Okay. My question is that as homeopathic medicine is quite common, uh, but we see that in general practice, most of the drugs which have been prescribed they mostly depend upon symptoms or we just ask the symptom but we didn't done the examination or investigations. So my question is that sometime we miss the diagnosis without doing investigation or examination. So can we improve the homeopathy medicine with examination and investigations? But what would that examination lead you to? <coughs> this is the question. Yeah. So uh, for example somebody come with a headache here, yeah. we just ask uh, where is the headache, at what, what sort of it and uh, and what time is it? Mm -hmm. But uh, it might be due to high blood pressure, maybe due to okay. low blood glucose. So if you find out it is high blood pressure, how will you find the remedy in homeopathy? Because even high blood pressure remedies are related to symptoms. Yes, but but if we do, if we don't check the blood pressure, we just oh, ask here. Yeah. Okay, if you check the blood pressure, find out yeah. that it is blood pressure. Yeah. Then will you hand the patient over to to allopathy? No, with homeopathy. How will you treat such a patient? Because blood pressure does not mean that a patient requires that drug. No, blood pressure is a symptom. Yes, but patient don't say to you, yeah, I have got a blood pressure. He just they don't have to. Because even if they say I have blood pressure, even if you don't go to the doctors or laboratories, the patient comes and tells you, I am suffering from high blood pressure. You, you have no remedy for high blood pressure in homeopathy. Yes. But the symptoms created by high blood pressure are treated and then high blood pressure automatically is cured if the symptom, message of the symptoms was clearly understood and the related medicine is provided. So it's immaterial whether somebody is suffering from cancer or uh, you know blood pressure or uh, sugar or whatever you name you give to the disease. If the symptom complex is read correctly and properly, then the medicine will automatically appear, which will be which will correspond to that symptom complex. So. The, it is not just the symptoms which are removed. Again, it's a misunderstanding on the part of the allopaths that they think that we go just for symptoms. The symptoms are created in groups by certain poisons. So they identify a poison within the symptom. If that poison is given in very minute doses according to homeopathic system of treatment, then this poison creates a reaction against itself and the root cause is removed otherwise symptoms will not go. So this is the whole system. That is why even those who have no knowledge whatsoever of science, anything, anything in fact, but they have read homeopathy quite a lot, even they can sometimes you know, succeed in miraculous cures because they stick to symptoms. But 
still I do not deny the fact that if you improve your knowledge, it will be helpful for you to practice homeopathy better than others. So to improve knowledge of the allopathic system of cure and investigation is very useful. But the a homeopath does not depend on this. It is an additional help, maybe. For instance, in some cases it could be of additional help in the sense that somebody suffer, suffering from headaches comes to you and the medicines which come to your mind could be those who raise the blood pressure and could be those who lower the blood pressure as one symptom. So, if you know whether the blood pressure is high or low, then immediately you will ignore that class of, uh, that category of medicines which are covered by the same patient's symptoms, which lowers the blood pressure because the blood pressure is already low. So, that is why I say incidentally they could be helpful. But as a system, if you are an expert, you do not require that because if you go into a more minute examination, the symptoms themselves will let you know that this medicine should not be used, that should be used. And it will always correspond correctly to the nature of disease. So many a time I have cured a patient of some disease which he or she came with and I went not by the name of the disease but by the name, by the symptoms which uh, they presented and which I understood as a group indicating a certain medicine. And next time they came to report that uh, this was cured of course, but how did you know that we were suffering from that or that or that trouble as well? All these things have gone. Even tumors disappeared. While I did not treat them for tumors. So this is the advantage of the system. Because once the symptom complex is well understood and recognized, then it takes care not of the symptoms, but of the root cause, which may relate to other diseases present in the symptom, in the system, whose symptoms were not discussed with you. You understand the point? Yes. Muhammad Murad uh, from uh, United Arab, Arab Emirates mm -hmm. asks, uh, when Ramadan arrives, the gates of paradise are open and the gates of hell are locked up and Satan's are put in chains. He says he cannot understand the philosophy of Satan being put in chains. He should write to the video audio department and ask them to send him either video as he requires or an audio of my sermons before Ramadan which deal with this subject specifically. It took me an hour in one Friday and maybe follow, I will follow it up with another. So how can I answer in a few minutes all this important question, eh? all the aspects which needed to, need to be answered. Eh? Please. Um, so is there any place in, um, of morality in politics? You see, there's positive. In, in the modern understanding of the word politics, there is no room for morality. But politics, the philosophy of politics, requires an overall moral purpose which governs it, but only theoretically. So you can't completely sever the ties of politics from morality in that larger sense. What is the meaning of democracy? If it is not the right of the, you know, let me, let me, the three parts to it. The government, by the people, of the people, for the people. In this uh, uh, three-pronged principle, you can read 
an underlying philosophy of morality. People must have a right to rule themselves. So this goes for the first part. And when they rule themselves, it should be their representatives who should be appointed to rule them, not just somebody else who uh, inquires about their wishes. And the last part, the purpose should be to serve their cause. So all these three parts of the moral, uh, of the political philosophy are based on morality. But all the knowledgeable people who speak on the morality of politics admit, even Aristotle did, that in practical terms this is not possible. If it becomes real, then it is called polity, not democracy. Polity means when this democrat democratic definition is completely realized and the society does become a picture of this principle in, in action. So, morality gives root, gives, uh, I mean, morality gives birth to the concept of democracy. Then it retires. And if it does not, it is made to retire. This is the unfortunate situation, huh? yeah. right? Thank you. In practical, poli practical politics nowadays, you don't see any morality at work at all. Yes, uh, what will happen to the Muslim people who don't accept Ahmadiyya in the Judgment Day? Uh, are they will treat? They will be answerable to God. That's what will happen to them. Oh. See, when God takes the command of things in his own hands, that is what we understand as sending of prophets. When he sends someone for himself, he takes the command directly. And uh, you know, disrobes the so-called ulama of their offices and positions they hold in the in any religious people among any religious people. Then they just of leaders in name. If somebody does not respond to that call, he is ob obviously held responsible for his actions and whatever may happen to him. And because of his negation of a true messenger of God, whatever happens to the society as such, so he is responsible for himself, for his family, for the whole society as such, because of his refusing to accept a messenger of God appointed directly by God. So all the consequences which are logical, uh, which you can logically expect to be born out of this situation, will be born and uh, everybody will be responsible. But whether he will go to hell or not, this is not my or your, your position to, or your uh, uh, right to decide. We can give warnings. We can't decide. That is why all the prophets of Allah are declared, are, are introduced as warners or harbingers of glad tidings. Never as uh, dictators who decide here on earth. Nor as such judges in that sense that they will pass the judgment and uh, their judgment will be carried out into action. Whenever it comes to judgment, it's transferred to the day of judgment. Whenever it, it, ever, it comes to the deliverance of warning, this is the purpose of prophethood and this is what they do. See? Yes. So Allah knows best what will happen to them. But whatever the prophets do, it's this, our responsibility to do exactly the same. We must go on warning those who we want to, whom we want to save. We must go on giving glad tidings if they mend their ways and accept the a person appointed by God. 
that this is what you will be, you, uh, this is, this will be your benefit out of acceptance, right? Yes. So, you understand your problem, you have come a large family, from a large family who are non Ahmadis, his close relatives, dear parents and sisters, brothers, etc. And actually because he accepted Ahmadiyya meaningfully, with deep dedication, he is immediately worried about those who have not. So, I have told you this is your responsibility and this is not a responsibility, this will be born from within, you know. This uh, desire, this impulsion to have them all with you, this is what motivates the prophets because their care for the society is even more for our care for our relatives. So, you get charged with the prophetic mission in that regard and start sending them warnings and also the glad tidings. Right? Yes. Okay. My second question it has to do with like the Holy Quran, since it, it impresses upon us to uh, the way to conduct our daily lives, does it in any way strike a balance between capitalism or communism? And the, with the recent collapse of the Soviet empire, do you think communism will come back to the extent that it was? Or are we heading in the year 2000 towards a capitalist society? I am still at a loss to understand what you want to find out. And how do you build the similarity between Islamic injunctions and communist philosophy? Unless you make yourself clear, I can't answer this question. I do not see any similarity between Islamic concept of belief in God and uh, our genuine attempt to live according to the wishes of God. And the communist philosophy which begins with the negation of God and negation of morality. Without these two negations, no communist concept of state can be built. Everything has to be man-made because there is no God. Everything should be without morality because morality will interfere with the day-to-day -day operation of communist world which is even free to commit crimes against other people it, which can even issue edicts in favor of mur mass, mass scale murders like Stalin did because it will serve your philosophy. So This can't be done in moral with, the, with recognition of morality. These are the two first steps taken in the direction of building a communist empire or communist philosophy. Where is the similarity between this and Islam? Yes. Oh, yeah. yes. That's right. Right? Right. Mm. Um, do you think that we're heading in the year 2000 towards a capitalistic society? No. No. I reject on the basis of the Quranic teaching, the capitalistic philosophy as well. In fact, capitalist philosophy is a misnomer. There is no philosophy. Lack of communist philosophy and lack of religion create whatever is left, which is capitalism. Capitalism is another name for materialism. Like communism is a name for materialism. <laughs> So, on this topic, I have uh, spoken at length in the book which I have just finished on the 31st of December, which I have been following the Jamaat for a long time, but because of lack of time and because of lack of professional help, only volunteers came to help me from time to time. It became so problematic to correct some passages which I had dictated and when I read them again I found that the words were misunderstood, you know, the places where I wanted to correction to be made instead of there they were inserted somewhere else. So it was off on and on and on 
this headache continued until I practically rewrote it the whole, whole, the whole of the book. And Shah Sahib knows me. He helped me very ably in preparing uh, the, uh, in the book form, the lecture I delivered here. What was the name? Islam's response to the modern, not to, to the contemporary issues. And Shah Sahib, mashallah, uh, did it much better than many others voluntary workers did. Only I had to resist his suggestions. Because from time to time he would say, uh, perhaps this, I said, no, for God's sake, help me, but do not become a partner in this, in this treatise. <laughs> so that is what I, I never permit others to do. It should be my work, not anybody else's, but as far as the mystics are concerned, dictation uh, is concerned, corrections are concerned, they should be placed in the right order, in the right places. In that, Shah Sahib has done much better work than anyone else with whom I have worked. MashaAllah. Moreover, he was so honest about it, whenever he introduced something from himself, before finalizing it, he told me, that is the place. So I said, no, I would like it to be done like this, not like that. And then he would have a good laugh and say, yes, yes, I, I agree. <laughs> so it was a pleasure working with you, I know. But it took us much shorter time to prepare that text than this one. So you are very busy now. Right? Because of being busy and because of my m meetings, with the worker, voluntary workers who did a wonderful job, in fact, of a great sacrifice. The time lasts between the two meetings. Sometimes I could meet them after three months. By that time, they had forgotten what I meant by placing this thing from here to there. And I had forgotten that I had already said the same things elsewhere. So. <laughs> Repetitions began to occur. When I reread them, I was amazed. I said, Gosh, if I had not reread it, then this is what people would think is my work. So I had to consider it out and then start from the beginning again. This process came to an end with the grace of Allah on the 31st of December. After I took it up on my own to write most of the book instead of depending on any translation or any correction which was dictated by me. So very few alterations were dictated after I had written practically the entire book. I kept only those parts which were rightly, uh, uh, rightly understood by those who took dictations. So it's a combination of dictation plus a rewrite of the whole subject. That's one reason why it took so long. And the other is, it has nothing to do with the honorary workers who did a wonderful job. It is because of my, my fault of my memory. I have read so much on this and that before, that during this subject, the, it all came up to me. But I couldn't remember the references exactly, which was the book exactly, which was the number of the magazine, from Scientific American or any other magazine from which I quoted. Even I forgot the names of the writers. So to go through all the background of what I had read and help me retrieve the lost references was a big job. It was largely done by American team under Malik Masood Sahib and uh, the British team under Salia Safi. She's an expert librarian and uh, if these though two teams had not helped me, it would be very difficult for me to provide references, although whenever the references were provided, the, my memory about the subject was proved absolutely correct. I was never wrong in remembering the subject matter. But the references were beyond me to remember. So with the grace of Allah, it happened surprisingly here in one case, the top experts on the subject from England 
were contacted by someone who was helping me and he said, whatever you have written has no record, no trace of any scientific evidence in support of it. So, you must have forgotten. I said, I have not forgotten. This is exactly what it is. If the British scientists do not know it, it does not mean that it does not exist. And thanks to Malik Masood Sahib and uh, Salahuddin, who is one of the main workers in this team, they retrieved that magazine, which was fully supported with scientific data, and exactly the same thing which I said was found literally, literally true. So, this is why it took me so long. The book was, is concerned not only with one or two, three subjects like that book did. It covers almost everything in which man is interested today. And all the prophecies of the Quran, not all, but category-wise, most of the categories of the prophecies of the Quran, which relate to our age, have been covered. So it's a very vast subject which I undertook. And thank God, at last, I feel relieved. And when you go through it, most of the questions you have raised, yes. you will find answered more than what you inquire for. Because many an aspect of the same questions you have not asked, when you read my answers, they will rise in your mind as a necessary consequence of reading one explanation, giving birth to other questions. So I have attempted very genuinely and honestly to cover the whole subject exhaustively, raising questions myself and answering them. So I hope, inshallah, you will find it uh, quite interesting. When is it being released? Huh? The book, when is it being released? I have already informed you that the, it is completed. But the last reading is now being done by me. And because of the shortage of time again, I did the specimen reading and found that this time it is worthy of representing me. And uh, I have asked some other English speaking people from born here in England who have this special talent of reading very carefully and finding fault with it, finding any fault which might have crept into it. So they are helping me. And I think it shouldn't be a job of more than two months or so. But everything is ironed out and smooth. Just reading and finding this odd bit of mistake here and there is all the task left to it. Right? So, inshallah, I am, now I am really confident, inshallah, that uh, before this Jalsa Sarana, this will be book will be in the hands of all the, um, the audience, uh, readers and with them, with, through them, for all those who are interested. Another thing which I wanted to share with you is very interesting. According to the in charge of this, uh, you know, this uh, job, this task, who was to see that everything which I dictated is right, no mistake is, is there and this and that, everything is in order. He reported to me before the beginning of the last year, in the, by the end of the previous year. That the book is ready, now you can go ahead and have it published. So fortunately, I gave it to somebody else to have a glance and I received a shocking news that most of it is considered to be ready because the person who read it did not understand it. <laughs> when I read it, I was horrified. Literally, you know, I was, I was in jitters. I said, God, if this rubbish had been published, what would happen to the cause which I am representing? Not to me, but the cause, the the truth of the Quran, that is the cause. So I was terrified. And then many helpers came and said, we are going to help you and start dictating, re-dictating things and correcting. When those corrections were made, a few months ago, 
when I was told everything is ready, then when I read it, then I was again horrified. I said, despite all this, they are completely misplaced things. Half of the chapter where it belonged was taken away and put somewhere else. Correction was made here, it was inserted somewhere else. So that was the real panic, you know, which under which I started working myself and I found a lot of time doing my travels to Germany, to Holland, to Norway, to Sweden. On my, during my journeys in the car, I had time and then during the nights. So with the grace of Allah, now I am satisfied. Except for a few mistakes which are much human, you know. Everything is fine, inshallah. <laughs> Thank you, Please. So my second question is regarding life insurance. So is, is the life insurance is forbidden in Islam? Any insurance which does not have any element of uh, interest or gambling is uh, all right by Islam. It means it's, it's forbidden. Pardon? It means it's, it's forbidden. What I said is, is exactly what I, it means. Any insurance which in its conditions does not include any condition which turns it into a gambling, or a gamble, yes. or any condition which turns it into usury or interest. That intuition which is free from these two, this, uh, that uh, insurance which is free from these two elements is all right by Islam, no problem. And there are such conditions, I know, which are now, nowadays becoming more popular. And uh, such insurance companies which are uh, presenting new package deals, uh, but through experience have regained this wisdom that insurance should not contain any element of uh, usury or gambling. They are in the market and you can go ahead and utilize them. Right? Any question or yes. how long it is? One minute left. Huh? Just one minute. Just okay. a reminder that there won't be uh, any lessons, uh, sorry, any question answered during Ramadan, but right. immediately after Ramadan. And if any reader has got any questions, they can certainly send it to us. Of uh, course. Yes. Now this is the last question and answer session before the Ramadan which is about to start on Saturday. So all the viewers are requested to, s to direct their questions to the Imam London Mosque or to Mansoor Ahmed Shah Sahib of London. Your offices, what office do you hold nowadays? Secretary Tarbiyat. Secretary? Tarbiyat. Tarbiyat. So, either Imam Sahib, most often he uh, monitor, organizes this be such meetings, but when he is not here, he uh, hands the task over to Sayyidina Susha Sahib. So, if they send their queries either to the Imam Sahib or to him, we will entertain them, inshallah, after Ramadan. Right? Absolutely. Assalamu alaikum.